My name is Robert Jenkins. I'm the CEO and a co-founder at Cloud Sigma. We're a public infrastructure as a service provider. And really the aim of this webinar today was to give some of our users and some maybe potential new users and customers the opportunity to understand some of the optimization strategies around billing, around uh, operations that we see our customers using. Um, obviously, in the position that we're in, we get to chat with a lot of different customers, and so the idea is to have a bit of knowledge transfer between some of our customers and and all the attendees here today. Just on a kind of um, practical note, there is an ability to have questions. Um, the webinar, my presentation, won't run for more than 30 to 40 minutes maximum, and I'll try and keep it uh, succinct. If you do have a question, you can type it in. There's a Q&A function. So simply type it in. Uh, we, we aren't ignoring you. I'll simply pick those questions up at the end of the of the presentation. My uh, co-founder and, and, and colleague Patrick is also here with me, so he'll be uh, making sure all the questions are addressed at the end of the, the webinar. So without further ado, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off. I'm going to flip over to the presentation now um, so you can follow along. So let me just share my screen. Okay, so <clears throat> just to start my presentation, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on Cloud Sigma to put it in context before we go into the, the details on optimization, etc. cetera. So um, we founded the company in 2009, and really we, we were motivated to do so because we were frustrated with some of the public cloud offerings that were on the market at that time, and we wanted to um, bring something to market that had a differentiated approach. Um, and really that, that was born of the frustrations we had around the flexibility and control that you could achieve in a public cloud. And we feel that those uh, complaints, let's say, or frustrations are still as valid today as they were back in 2009 when we started. So the idea behind Cloud Sigma, as you'll see later on in the presentation, is to um, combine the sort of benefits of public cloud, which are things like elasticity, a, tra a transparent total cost of ownership, geodispersal, you know, I can, I can spin up virtual machines all over the world, uh, and automation, and combine those with the things that people traditionally associate with a private cloud, but be able to offer them in a public cloud as well. So that means really, as much as possible, complete control over your deployment in the cloud um, on a mature technology stack, and would do that without sacrificing performance. So it's really all about control and flexibility. So the idea is that you can control your cloud environment with Cloud Sigma. Um, so that's kind of the, the background. Uh, and the result of that is this Cloud Sigma product that we have. Um, it is quite different from some other clouds, so there is a bit of a learning curve there. But we believe once you go through that learning curve, there's a lot of benefits on the other side. So that's enough about plugging Cloud Sigma. I'll now go through some of the interesting points I wanted to make. Uh, during the, the presentation. So there are really five sections to this webinar. Um, firstly, I'll talk about server sizing um, and some strategies around that and also some tools that we use at Cloud Sigma for our own services to monitor and, and size servers and resize them over time. Then I'll talk a little bit about billing optimization, some of the purchasing strategies that we see from different customers, uh, specifically regarding our pricing mechanism, but they can also be applied to other clouds. Um, then I'll talk about performance tweaking. So believe it or not, customers can achieve um, anything from 20-30% to up to 50% performance benefits simply by optimizing their virtual machines to their specific application requirement. Um, and bearing in mind that computing is a means to an end, if you can make the same deployment, the same cost uh, of resources create 50% more computing for you, that's essentially like lowering the price by 30 to 40 to 50%. So it's something that's worth looking at. And, and uh, it's, it's, um, it's something that's certainly, as you scale out in the cloud, worth engaging in. And then finally, an area that's interesting and quite hot at the moment is how are people leveraging containers in the cloud? Um, how are people, you know, sort of mapping those onto their more traditional uh, virtual machine deployments that they're seeing in the cloud? And then finally, we'll, we'll have the, have the Q&A. And as I said, there'll be plenty of time for that at the end. So I, I want to leave time for everybody. So in terms of server sizing, you can, uh, I, I've created this kind of slide. The idea is that each one of those boxes is a virtual machine, and you have two axes, RAM and CPU. And um, the green is what you're using. The 
the kind of pinkish gray is is the sort of size of the VM. And what normally happens with scaling and server sizing is that you want to keep a, a decent buffer or a uh, of the C of the VM size around that sort of green area, the way it's done visually. But at the same time, when you become RAM limited or CPU limited, which is when you fill up all the RAM or you fill up all the CPU, you need to resize the server. Um, so one of the things that um, so the, the question is, how do you trigger those processes, which we'll come to, but also, you know, what are the differences with different clouds and how they achieve that? So one of the things. Um, to do with scaling that's interesting with Cloud Sigma is this concept of perfect provisioning. The idea is that you can always size that green box with the pink around it linearly as you grow, meaning that if you need more RAM, you add more RAM. You don't need to add more CPU. So the example in the, in, on the left is this, is this would be a virtual machine that's RAM limited. Essentially, the RAM has been filled. A great example of this would be a database server, like a SQL server. Um, from you know, Oracle, for example, or, or, or Microsoft, when they become RAM limited, which is a typical uh, resource constraint, you need to resize them. Now, if you have to resize them up to a fixed server size that's the next one up, typically that will come with additional CPU, uh, additional RAM, which is what you need, but also potentially additional storage and, and, and other things. So the idea in Cloud Sigma, which is different from the other clouds, is that, or at least most of the other clouds, is that you can just simply scale up the RAM. You don't need to scale any of the other resources. <clears throat> now, that gives you a saving not only from the CPU perspective, but it also gives you a saving from a licensing perspective because we have a lot of customers who are using commercial products that are based on the number of cores. So it's very important for them to be able to um, scale up things like RAM or storage independently of other resources like CPU. And by doing that, not only can they keep a much more efficient deployment over time in a dynamic sense, but they can also avoid unnecessary license fees. So when you're looking at um, clouds and optimizing, uh, the kind of implementation of virtual machine sizing is very important. Um, if they do have fixed virtual machines, having virtual machines, more virtual machine, machine sizes is, is, um, is obviously beneficial. And on the flip side, if, a, if you have someone that can offer you this kind of idea of a unbundled resources, then that's also beneficial as well because you're able to eliminate those kind of locked-in resources that are provisioned to you and paid for and implicit in the price, which you can't actually use because you don't need them. Um, so this is a, a typical model, for example, in media for cable companies where they bundle many different channels. Bundling is a very well-known uh, strategy to make customers pay more. So we don't have bundling, and when you're looking at different clouds, it's worth considering because... Um, even if day one it might not be that important to you, certainly as you scale up, bundling can become a really big negative in terms of the amount of efficiency that you get. It's one of the reasons why some customers migrate out of public clouds when they get larger, because they're in a cloud which has this bundling type model. So in terms of sizing resources and sizing individual servers, um, a couple of points I wanted to make and a couple of things that we see customers doing successfully. So one of the things is to use a monitoring tool um, that actually is able to very accurately measure your CPU and RAM utilization over time. And that's going to let you size the servers efficiently, which could include downscaling them so you don't have to buy resources you don't need. So we, uh, we recommend New Relic. Um, we also use open source tools like Zabbix to do this, but New Relic has a very... Um, good application layer implementation as well. So not only can you see the sizing of the resources, but you can optimize your applications and find the bottlenecks within them. Uh, and actually all our customers receive a, a free upgraded account of New Relic, um, which is integrated into our system. So you can literally spin up VMs and it will start posting data back to New Relic if you've set that up. Um, so the, the, the kind of feedback loop that you need to do the scaling um, is a monitoring tool. And it could be something free like Zabbix, or it could be a commercial product like New Relic. Um, but that you need that gathering of data to make the intelligent decision in terms of scaling. And the second part is the resource scaling. And again, there are a different number of tools and logics that you can use, but one that I'd encourage you to look at um, as an example, which maybe is not that well known, but actually works really well, is a product called the Flexian Cloud uh, Concerto Platform. And they have a number of clouds integrated, including Cloud Sigma, but they include people like Google, Amazon, 
um, DigitalOcean and others, so you can actually orchestrate multiple clouds, and at the same time, they tie into New Relic, and New Relic has something called AppDex, which I'll show you on the next screen. And AppDex is, a, is a, um, an overall scoring based on your uh, metrics that you've given it in terms of what's important. And based on that scoring, these are, this is a real screenshot from our API in Zurich, one of our API servers. And so this shows you not only where the load is and the responsiveness of the service, but also it gives you on the top right there this um, AppDex scoring. And you can actually link the AppDex scoring to an auto-scaling um, tool, such as Flexience Concerto and others. And this is the best implementations that we've seen from customers that do this, because essentially it's a results-driven scaling platform. It's looking at the um, quality of service being delivered to the customer from their cloud service, and then it's linking that to scaling up those resources. This is also very interesting when you come to the containers, uh, which we'll, uh, we'll talk about later, where we talk about uh, the idea of container clouds, which are um, service-specific. Um, and linking this in can be, it kind of closes the loop and it can become extremely efficient in scaling individual services. Um, talking about billing optimization and strategy, so what you see across most clouds is a trade off between flexibility and cost level. And generally speaking, the more flexible uh, the purchasing, meaning the shorter term the purchasing, <clears throat> the more expensive it is relative to a longer term commitment. And this is typical not just in cloud but in, in many services. And so really um, the key here is to define how you're going to purchase along that line between ad hoc very short term purchasing which is extremely flexible but expensive relatively to a longer term purchase which again is quite inflexible but will give you a better price. And so what we see customers doing that do this most effectively, and this is just sort of made up figures to give you a visual, the idea is that you create sort of a layer cake approach. So there will be extremes and some customers will only need short term and some customers will only need long term, but most customers are growing or have changing requirements. And so what you can do is apply this layer cake approach. So what I mean by that is you buy the base load, you buy your minimum requirement that you have a high level of confidence in needing for the foreseeable future and you buy that on a longer term basis. So you might buy this base load for a year or even three years if you're a relatively mature business. And at the same time, you're going to have other requirements which you're not as confident about. So for example, if you were using uh, say 300 gigabytes of RAM, you might be confident that the first 150 you're always going to need because they're being used for core services like email and various other internal services. On the other hand, there may be that other 150 that sits above that or 200 that sits above that. You don't have a, the same level of visibility in the longer term. So the idea is you're matching that visibility and confidence to your purchasing length. So you buy the longer term, more confident uh, consumption level on a longer term basis, and then you layer up the uh, shorter term needs right up to the point where you essentially have ad hoc usage. Um, and you can adjust that over time. So as you grow, you can review that uh, quarterly or biannually, and you can say, well, you know, now we know we were, we were consuming 150 gigabytes before that we knew was a core requirement, now it's 200. And so you can essentially fold that ad hoc requirement into a medium or long-term requirement over time. And so the idea is to visualize and think about your consumption in terms of these layers. Um, things that you know are long-term, things that you have a confidence in, and things that you're less confident in, so that you can avoid over-purchasing, but at the same time you can lock in better prices and better terms for the things that you do have confidence in. And customers that do this tend to achieve a much lower price per unit of computing than, than, than the customers that don't. Just one other thing I wanted to say was that actually it's surprisingly common that customers have billing problems or outages in the cloud. This is not just at Cloud Sigma, in a lot of clouds. Um, and this is probably as much a common cause of outages as real outages where the cloud has an issue. Um, and so one of the things you should look at, because they're definitely underused, we see this from our own customers, are mechanisms which allow you to better manage your billing and automate your billing um, within your cloud account um, because this really will avoid a lot of the outages that many people um, get unnecessarily. 
So a couple of things that we offer, which is typical also for other clouds, um, you can save a payment method. Now that means saving a credit card on record with the cloud provider. Now most cloud providers don't save that credit card. Um, it's actually saved with a payment processor, which is the same payment processor that you, you use when you make a credit card payment. So they already have that credit card on record from your last payment. So it's not actually saving that data with the cloud provider. So for example, at Cloud Sigma, when you save a payment method with us, we don't keep the credit card number, nor would we wish to. We simply have a hash which allows us to make a repurchase. So um, that's a very good mechanism to um, have a sort of uh, safety valve on your account. So if you go below a certain threshold of um, account balance, you can, if you enable this, you can, these are the two scales that you see on this screen, you can have a minimum top up amount and a minimum top up threshold. So I might say I want um, to top up $200 when my account gets to $50. And this means that you have a buffer of $50 even if your credit card failed, but at the same time, in a normal operation, you would simply, your balance would go between 50 and $250. Uh, it would go up to 250 and then it would decay back down to 50, you'd repurchase, etc. So you have this cycle. Um, this is for sort of uh, prepayment uh, methods. The other thing to do is a lot of customers, especially long-standing customers or larger customers, they also have a credit limit. So we can actually implement credit limits. And again, a lot of clouds, if you ask them, they can implement credit limits for you, where you simply agree a limit that you need every month, and at the end of the month, they'll invoice you against that limit. Um, so it's not necessarily something that's always advertised, but it's almost always available. So the kind of considerations um, and the, the sort of triggers on the purchasing strategy are really um, the difference between the prices of longer term and short term purchasing and the differences in the purchasing lengths. This is what really will determine your strategy on billing. So for example, uh, the price between a one year purchase and a one month purchase, if a one year purchase is half the price of a one month purchase, then if you know you're going to need that VM for six months, then anything over six months, you can be confident that you should buy the one year price because at six months the price will have been the same as if you'd purchased it on a monthly basis for the whole year. So we, we have a similar thing with storage. Storage on burst, on short-term ad hoc usage is much more expensive than, um, than purchasing on subscription. So if you're using a storage for more than say 10 days, it's worth simply purchasing it for a month. So um, this is kind of the, 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 the decision-making matrix you have to go through. You have to think about, well, if I apply that discount to the price, how long would I have to use the resource to be essentially equal than the short-term purchasing. So that's the strategy to look at. And it will vary from provider to provider because they have different pricing metrics. And then the other thing, of course, is the length of time. So one month to one year to two years to three years. So those jumps also determine that. And if you just look at that um, analytically, you can actually come up with a pretty good strategy within five, 10 minutes of how you should be purchasing your resources. And just another thing, Clouds generally don't charge for traffic on their private networks. They only charge for public uh, interface traffic. So always if you have multiple cloud servers, if you throw them in a private network and route your traffic over the private network, at least within your cloud, you won't get charged for any of the traffic. And the private networks are generally quite cost effective. Uh, I know Amazon's a little bit more expensive, but most of the clouds are pretty cheap. And it's the same for our, our cloud as well. So it's always worth, if you have any sort of traffic between your VMs, getting a private network and putting all of your traffic within the private network. It's also much more secure if you do that as well. So the next uh, section I wanted to talk about was turning Lardas into Lamborghinis or, or performance tweaking in the cloud. And really, uh, this is all about the idea that there is no one golden setting for computing because there absolutely isn't. And what you can do, and we enable this to, to a sort of, maybe to an extreme in our cloud, but also there are tweaks available in other clouds, is the idea that you can optimize your virtual machines for the application requirement. That's something that I can't do as a cloud service provider because I don't know what you're trying to achieve with your virtual machine. So I can give you a best first setting, which I know works and most of the time will be the right setting, but I can't give you the absolute best 
setting for your particular virtual machine application. And you can actually go beyond those base levels of performance if you are prepared to do some tweaking and testing on the virtual machines. So that's kind of what I wanted to cover was some of the things you can do and you should try to uh, be able to achieve high performance levels. So this is our web app and I'm actually gonna flip over to the real web app. Um, just need to log in again. So this is our real web app in, uh, in Zurich and this is my account. I'm just logging in now. What I wanted to show you was some of the advanced settings that we expose on a per VM basis, which allows you to do some optimizations. So if I go in here to compute, and then what I'll do is I'll create a new server. And if I go to the advanced, so firstly you see that flexible resource sizing, which I was talking about earlier. And um, so let's set the CPU to 10, because I can use that as an example. And you'll see here we have this optimized for option. So you can say optimize for Linux or Windows or Solaris. Um, so I could say optimize for Linux, for example. And we will set the settings to the best Linux setting as a general rule, but it won't be completely optimized to your requirements. So you can actually go in and further optimize um, your virtual machine. So I wanted to take you through two or three simple things you can try that can actually improve your performance uh, significantly depending on your use case. So the first thing, the easiest thing to try, is to vary the number of uh, processes being uh, processes being simulated the cores. So what that does is, because you're not using physical cores, they're actually virtual. We have an ability to create more CPU threads to your virtual machine. Um, so we use two and a half gigahertz cores generally in our cloud. So that ten gigahertz that we uh, sized could be split into a minimum of four cores. And if you wanted the highest performance per core, that's fantastic. Four cores would be the ideal setting for you. However, maybe you're not CPU, maybe the, the, the limit on your performance isn't the uh, throughput of an individual CPU thread, but the number of CPU threads. Uh, a typical example of this would be something like a, a big data workload or any workload really where there's a lot of parallelization going on. And so in that case, you can actually scale down the per gigahertz size of your core but get more cores on the same virtual machine, the same size, and the same cost. So I'm just gonna do that, and so I could scale all the way up to 10 cores for that virtual machine. That virtual machine is still 10 gigahertz, but what we do now is we expose 10 CPU cores of the equivalent speed of one gigahertz. Um, and so what you, there's a sort of time scheduling that goes on on those cores to allow that to happen. But the, the, the effect is you get the equivalent of a one gigahertz core and you get 10 of them. So if you have an application that benefits from parallelization, simply moving that slider from four to 10 can have a profound impact on the performance you can achieve. And of course, this is a per VM setting, so you can do this on different virtual machines depending on what applications they're running. And this can really give you a big CPU performance. Two, and another thing um, that we have is this setting here that you see, which is the CPU model. So you can set this for compatibility to KVM, 64, which is an emulation, and actually most clouds do that. They don't give you the real CPU. But on the other hand, if you set it to host CPU, as I had it set, we actually expose all the instruction sets from the uh, processor up to uh, up to your, um, your virtual machine. And what that does is it allows you to, to use those instruction sets for things like encryption, media encoding, etc. So for those types of use cases, it's definitely worth using the host CPU and seeing if that works. Um, final thing on the CPU is the NUMA topology. NUMA is the uh, way memory is linked to the CPUs. And you don't really have to understand that much about it. The thing to note is that if you have a virtual machine that's larger, that has more cores, such as this one that has 10, it's going to span the physical processes on the motherboard. Because one processor might only have, say, 8 cores or 10 cores. And so the chances are, if you have a larger VM, it will be sitting on more than one socket, on the same motherboard, but different sockets. Anyway, long story short is that um, it's worth, if you have larger VMs, exposing NUMA and trying that and rerunning your performance testing, because especially in things like Windows, it can have a really uh, huge impact on the amount of performance that you can achieve. Uh, for example, we had a media company that was doing video uh, streaming, 
they simply turned Numeron on their large VMs and they saw a 40% increase in performance just simply by doing that. So it, it's a huge thing to be able to do. Um, for smaller VMs, it's less relevant, but for larger ones, it's definitely uh, worth having a look at. And then the final two settings are hypervisor settings, and these are really to do with Windows and the way it handles um, scheduling. But again, it's, it's worth turning them on and trying. Uh, we have a little help thing that tells you kind of generally what situations it works in when it doesn't, but it's worth trying those two as well. They can give you an extra, you know, 5-10% performance depending on the situation. So the idea is by layering up these different settings, you can uh, customize this, this virtual machine to your application requirement. And that's the, that's the power of it. And the, the end result is that you can buy less computing and get more performance. So you, you, you shift the price performance point for, the, for, for your cloud. So now I will go back and um, go back to the presentation. So I think we covered this. Um, so just one final thing also in the cloud, if you're uploading your own virtual machine images, um, obviously the cloud ones tend to have this all set already, but it's worth noting that um, Vert.io networking drivers, um, it's a networking driver written by Red Hat, um, they're available for Windows and for Linux. Uh, unfortunately, they're not available for the BSDs like FreeBSD. Um, but for Windows and Linux, they're available, and you should always use them. Uh, Virto networking drivers are essentially drivers that you put in the operating system, and then you can set the uh, emulation on the cloud to be Virto, and they kind of link together. And uh, they're much more tolerant of a virtualized environment, so they're able to achieve much higher performance levels than a regular... Um, emulation of a kind of physical networking card. So that's something that, especially if you're uploading your own ISOs, where essentially they're not dictated by the cloud vendor, it's worth making sure you use the Vert.io networking, uh, at least in our cloud, because it definitely gives you a big performance boost. And you can stream literally gigabits um, speed on a Vert.io networking driver based setup. And we have customers that do that. So, the final thing I wanted to talk about, and this was kind of drawing all this together and talking about maybe some of the more um, progressive um, uh, and advanced users that we have in our cloud, was how they're marrying the idea of a cloud and virtual machines, um, which you could consider to be a more of a traditional approach, even though, of course, cloud is not that old, uh, with containers and Docker and Rocket and all these kind of containers that are coming out that are becoming increasingly popular. And it's how you can marry all that together with what we said about performance optimization to sort of take your deployment to the next level. So um, I try to sort of explain, I don't really like this diagram, but I try to explain how you can use the Docker containers within your cloud service. So just the, the basic idea is that um, you normally have your virtual machines and each one of those is doing something like a database server, a web server, whatever it might be. The idea um, and the way we see customers using uh, containers is to actually use containers within virtual machines. And the reason to do that is because a virtual machine has a very strong level of separation from any other computing. So we use Linux KVM. It's a full virtualization platform. What that means is that those machines are black boxes to us. We couldn't tell you what, the, what operating system that virtual machine was running. We have no access to the file system, we have no access to the data, and nor does anyone else. And so it's a very secure, very private setup. And you can even go to the extent of uh, fully encrypting the drives that you use as well. So, and you keep the keys outside the cloud. So you can achieve a very high level of security uh, with um, virtual machines. Of course, it means that every virtual machine that you have, you're repeating the same operating system and that same overhead. So the idea of containers is that you don't have that overhead. Um, but the downside of containers is they have, compared to virtual machines, a poor level of separation between um, containers. Now, of course, providers do things to make that more secure, but in principle, the provider has a much higher level of visibility into containers just fundamentally than they do with virtual machines because the container is part of a wider file system, which means that the service provider, by definition, has access to all of the data in that container very easily. It also means if a physical machine in the cloud was to be compromised, 
they would be able to read off all the data from all the containers running on that virtual on that uh, physical machine. Now, in the case of a virtual machines running within a physical box, typical cloud servers, that's not the case because we still wouldn't have access, even if someone compromised that physical machine, for them to be able to get into the virtual machines. So. There's a big distinction in terms of security and privacy. And, and so the question is how you balance those two, the benefit of containers and the saving you make from operating system overhead with the benefit of security and privacy of VMs. So what we have is customers doing kind of what I've tried to show here. The idea is that you have standardized golden image um, virtual cloud servers, and within those you then have clouds or swarms of containers which are servicing a particular requirement. And so the idea there is that um, you can scale up the cloud servers and they just kind of become dumb service units which are all standardized. And then within that, you run various services which span multiple cloud servers. So you can imagine sort of groupings of different containers and you scale each one of those services independently. And this is where we get back to the new relic monitoring and the things I talked about at the beginning. So you can imagine, I've, I've done three different groups here, but you can imagine the monitoring service, which is in blue, the web service, and some other service, as I've called it in red, all being scaled independently of each other by something like a new relic feedback loop with, um, with either Flexient or some other solution for load balancing. And by creating these different layers of containers within the virtual machines, you can both use the virtual machines very efficiently, and at the same time, you can maintain this quality of service from the container level. And so this is a quite a different approach to a VM-based approach. And so what you do is you essentially scale these services independently of each other, and then you have a separate scaling layer, which is the virtual machine scaling layer. So if all your virtual machines were to become full, the uh, load balancer that you have on the virtual machines would simply add an empty virtual machine. And then the services that are Docker services or other container services would naturally um, scale up as required. And so by having these two layers of virtualization sitting on top of each other, you can attain, you can, um, attain a very high level of uh, service quality and at the same time be very efficient in the way you're purchasing resources. So from a practical perspective, Achieving that, what does it entail? And so I wanted to give you some starting points where you can have a look um, and start playing with this type of setup if you're not already doing so. So, so the first thing is um, you, can, you can combine having traditional VMs with containers. So you can have some of your services running on containers and some of them just being in, in VMs. Um, the, the, the areas that are going to be in Docker containers or other types of containers, they generally, it makes sense to move towards a microservice orientated architecture. So the idea of that is that um, you, you atomize all the different service components and then you scale each one individually based on requirements. It's also a very robust approach in terms of availability because if one service has an issue, you only lose part, part of the feature set as opposed to the whole service going down, which a more monolithic approach would have would, would cause. So the second thing, and this talks about the, the scaling and the metrics, is the idea of auto-configuring and auto-scaling servers. So I've put a link in there, and we'll email uh, the presentation, link to the presentation to everybody anyway, but uh, it's cld.sg forward slash Docker Cloud Init. And Cloud Init is a framework that allows you to inject scripts into the virtual machine on boot. So you can essentially take a standardized virtual machine image like Ubuntu or CentOS. You can have a script which then executes on the first boot, which does things like add SSH keys. It can add sp specific um, packages like a Docker um, and also update all the packages. So from a security perspective, it's up to date. So this framework is called Cloud Init. There's a couple of different ones uh, for different operating systems. Um, but the principle is it allows you to contextualize a standard library image into the golden image that you want to use as the basis for your container, cloud, swarm, whatever you want to call it within, within the cloud. This also means you can do this across multiple uh, cloud service vendors as well using the same standardized approach. Um, so I'll just show you on the web app really quickly. So you can see if you go to properties here, um, back in the web app, there's a button here called Cloud Init. And if I click that button, 
I can actually just copy paste a script in here, which is the script that's going to be used when I actually boot up that virtual machine. Uh, and we also have some help uh, for people to auto configure that. And of course, all of this can be driven over the API, which is what you do in an automated setup. So that's the second component. The second component of this uh, containers approach is once you have this sort of idea of services orientated approach on the containers, you layer that in with a standard golden image approach for the virtual machines that will hold those containers. And then the final kind of component to that to make it work effectively is the idea of prioritizing um, services. Because clearly some services are more important than others. Um, something that's doing a periodic routine or something like this can take backseat to um, resource requirement from the database service, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are certain critical elements, and so you can use. And this is also another benefit of putting those containers within your virtual machines, because you get to control then how those containers receive resources. So um, the third element which we see people doing is. Uh, the idea of prioritizing services and if essentially prioritizing groups of containers. And we have a blog post there which is uh, using our short URL cld.sg forward slash docker cgroups. And if you go to that post, you'll see a worked example of how you can um, create a virtual machine, put Docker containers inside, and control the allocation of resources and the prioritization of resources based on some logic that you dictate. And it's actually a very flexible and powerful framework. It's actually the same framework that we use uh, for containing load from customer virtual machines within our own cloud. And we open source that, um, that framework, and it's available on GitHub. So if you go to that post, you'll see a link to the GitHub repository, which you're welcome to take and also uh, contribute to if it's of interest. So using those three elements, you can create a very powerful um, VM container uh, approach that will give you um, a very optimized setup in the cloud. And also, I might add a, a setup which is very portable that you can use in not just Cloud Sigma, but other clouds as well. So um, I wanted to just put all in context. Ultimately, having an effective cloud deployment is, um, is a competitive advantage. It can give you a more reliable uh, quality of service for the service you're delivering from the cloud, and it can also um, or allow you to, to price that service more cheaply than, than the other guy, than, than your competition. So really, that's the aim. The ultimate aim of all this optimization is to, to get, get you to a better price performance point, a more effective deployment that's going to deploy, it's going to deliver a higher quality of service at a better price. Um, and that's really how we judge uh, you know, cloud deployments, our own cloud deployments and, and customers. So uh, that, was, that was it. Hopefully. In there, there was some information um, that might be uh, uh, useful to everyone. Um, there are, there, you can sign up instantly at cloudsigma.com if you haven't already. Um, also, if you have attended this webinar, um, we can give you a free upgrade and also a, a, a discount on the pricing for an initial period as a thank you for attending. If you email support at cloudsigma.com, they can send you all the details of that. Uh, and finally, you know, good luck with your, your cloud deployments. Now, if we do have some questions, then I have left some time at the end. So um, I'm just going to flip back and stop sharing my screen so we can. OK, so we've got some questions that came in. Um, so I'm just going to run through them. So looking at this, um, someone asks, this is a specific Cloud Sigma question, do you offer um, managed services? Um, on, on the virtual machines in the cloud? The answer is that traditionally we haven't, but more recently we have started to offer this, although it's not on our website already. So yes, we offer basic operating system level managed services and recovery. So the idea is if I had a, to make a simple uh, Ubuntu cloud server, um, rather than me managing that myself, I would continue to manage the application as a customer, but the operating system patching uh, backups, uh, recovery in case of a crash, those kind of uh, operations will be conducted by uh, Cloud Sigma. And of course, we're very reactive because we're already monitoring the cloud as well. So that's offered a, as a simple flat per virtual machine pricing. Um, so if that's of interest, um, you can uh, just email us and we can send you more information about that. Um, 
So someone's asking, what factors should you consider for um, the difference between uh, you know, hybrid, uh, what, what should I put on a public cloud versus what I should own in-house? Um, and basically, um, that, uh, that would kind of depend on your use case. So um, there, there are two aspects to it, really. The traditional and the kind of minimal engagement level for a um, public cloud would be your discretionary elastic requirements. So if you, uh, so as an example, if you're an e-commerce company, if I was uh, selling flowers, I'm going to have really big peaks around certain times of the year, like Christmas, Mother's Day, etc. So on those times, I could use a public cloud to bring in additional um, compute. And of course, using things like um, using things like uh, containers makes that even more uh, easy to do because you can have a completely uh, uh, combined environment between the private and public. The other thing is um, you can create a private patch between your physical environment and the public cloud. It's something that we offer as well, so uh, along with other clouds. And, and what that allows you to do is have a private only connection, so there's no public internet. So that means you can reduce the cost of your networking, and at the same time, it means you can reduce the uh, uh, security uh, risks that you may see uh, from using a public cloud. So we have a lot of customers that actually do that. They actually uh, connect into us in our data center, and we're on the Equinix Cloud Exchange as well. So, which a lot of people don't know about, but if that means that if you're in an Equinix data center, you can actually patch in through that cloud exchange into Cloud Sigma, and you can even do it from Amazon. So you can actually connect from Amazon via the Equinix Cloud Exchange to Cloud Sigma and have end-to-end -end private IP on a single network between your private network in Amazon and your private network in Cloud Sigma, which is uh, kind of pretty amazing compared to where things were maybe a few years ago. Just looking at things. So someone asking about, just as we're on kind of pricing, and then someone's asked about New Relic as well. Um, so asking about the subscriptions versus burst, um, the answer is uh, it varies from cloud to cloud. Like what is the difference between subscription and burst? I can tell you in Cloud Sigma, generally the burst is on average about 50% to 100% more expensive than a subscription. A subscription is for one month minimum. So what that means is, as a rule of thumb, if you're going to use the resource for less than, say, two weeks, then fine, you know, just use it ad hoc on burst. But if you're going to use it for more than two weeks, normally it's, that's the time when you would consider to just purchase for a month. And that's, that's the idea. And the, 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 the subscriptions are based per resource. So you can scale up CPU or scale up RAM or scale up storage independently of each other. So the idea is if you need more RAM, just buy more RAM. You don't need to buy the other things as well. Um, and, and as those subscriptions renew, you can downscale as well. So that's kind of the concept. Someone's asking about how to sign up to New Relic. So uh, the answer is that um, we, we, we just upgraded our web app, which is the new web app that you saw. It's a lot faster, and we've actually got a lot more features on it. The new Relic integration didn't survive the upgrade, so we're actually re-implementing that at the moment. Um, so having told you about this amazing new Relic thing, it's not actually there on the web app right now, so I'm sorry about that, but it literally happened the other week that we were upgrading. But we are, it's not forgotten and we have it. So if you want to use the new Relic integration, just ping our support. We have a live chat on the bottom of the, it's down here, on the bottom of the, the web app, and they'll respond within minutes. It's very, very easy for you to sign up. And what we offer is, um, and an upgraded, New Relic have a free tier, which gives you basic information like CPU and RAM utilization, which to be honest is probably all you need, but we also have an upgraded tier, um, and if you upgrade to the upgraded tier, you get an additional, um, you get additional uh, monitoring and, and, and greater data retention that you don't get on the free tier, and that is free for Cloud Sigma customers as well, so essentially you get an, an enhanced free tier. Um, and then the second point to make is that when you do the uh, activation of New Relic, when you do that, you can actually, um, it puts a um, software license key in your global metadata. What that means is that when you spin up a virtual machine that has the New Relic agent on it, or you add a New Relic agent onto that virtual machine, the Cloud Sigma agent, it, it then sees the license key in the metadata, and it, it then starts sending the data to New Relic. So if you have that license key in your metadata, it will automatically send the data to New Relic. So it's a very slick implementation. So I saw that uh, Cyril asked this question about New Relic. So 
Um, you can actually use the old web app version to do that, or you can get support to help you do that. But it's completely available still, it just hasn't been fully exposed yet on the new web app. Okay, that was actually all the questions. Um, if anyone had anyone else, any other question, you should ask now, uh, or raise your hand. It's possible to raise your hand. Patrick tells me, how do you raise your hand? Ah, have people raised their hand? Someone has raised their hand, okay. Oh yes, uh, John Daniel. Um, what do I do? Should I put him on? Yes, da uh, I see. John Daniel has uh, looking for us a question. Um, let me add you and see what happens. Sorry, this is our first time, sir. I'm not sure whether that's going to work. No, it didn't work. Okay, it's fine. Um, all right. Well, listen. Thanks everybody for joining today. Uh, I don't want to take up any more time. Uh, I hope the presentation was useful. We'll plan to do some more around other things like backup strategy, uh, storage management. We have uh, quite a few interesting uh, things that customers are doing around that. Um, and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, a copy of the, the recording will be available and the presentation to everybody. And um, I wish you a good day and good luck with your cloud deployments. Thank you everyone.